Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to uh, NOLA Theater Talk. My name is Alan Smason, and I want to thank you very much for being here tonight. Uh, it is at an earlier time, and there are some reasons for that. Uh, because of the busy uh, weekend schedule that I've got, I had to go uh, earlier today or not do it at all. Uh, there is, uh, of course, uh, a number of duties that I have to observe as a theater reviewer, and i um, there is a show needing to be reviewed, and uh, there is no possible time to do it other than tonight. So uh, hopefully that will work out for everybody, that uh, you join me on this uh, very, very important uh, discussion uh, about a, uh, a major figure in black theater who we lost this last Saturday at the age of 90, Douglas Turner Ward. And we're going to get into that in just a little bit, but I, I want to sort of back up a little bit um, and, and explain that uh, even though he was not really a pivotal figure here in New Orleans on the New Orleans theater scene, I have no doubt that what he did up in the New York area uh, radiated down uh, the domino theory, as you will uh, know from, from uh, other uh, political discussions, that what he did in New York uh, was uh, so much uh, as acting as a pioneer and, and had such an impact that uh, it was like the wake that came out of the pebble that is thrown into the pond and all of those emanations that uh, come forth. Uh, he uh, uh, was, was an instrumental figure and there's no doubt about the fact that he uh, changed the course of uh, black theater as a result. So we're gonna talk about uh, Douglas Turner Ward and uh, uh, I'm gonna basically offer the opportunity for those of you who are, uh, are interested in, in taking part in the discussion. Some of you may know or know of his work, and um, I'm going to be uh, uh, respectful of, of your time. And, and uh, if you're interested in, in, in taking part, uh, I'm going to offer you the opportunity to uh, use your browser, uh, check your, your mic and your camera, uh, and uh, become a, a member of uh, this discussion tonight. Uh, those of you who want to join the conversation, this is all you have to do to join in. Um, whether or not I recognize you is another story. I probably will be able to recognize some of you. And uh, again, if those of you who want to leave comments, please uh, feel free to do so throughout the broadcast. Again, uh, we're slated to go all the way till 6.30. Hopefully we will. Uh, those of you who are, um, again, interested in, in joining the conversation, this is the way to join. It'll be a live event. You will be live on the air. Uh, earbuds are suggested that uh, you won't get any feedback as a result. So if you have headphones or earbuds, we strongly uh, advise you to put those on before you try to uh, to check in. Um, and again, um, let's get sort of into it. Uh, I, I've got a, a, a few pictures uh, that I wanted to share out of um, of Douglas. Uh, and uh, again, uh, not all of them are are necessarily the best pictures, but uh, uh, you know they, they are what they are. I, I, I uh, will tell you that this is. A, a fairly recent picture uh, that was taken from uh, a piece that he did uh, with uh, uh, American Theater. And um, also, uh, uh, again, for those of you who uh, may not remember uh, his work with, uh, with the Negro Ensemble Theater, some of the people, uh, you know, uh, were pivotal. Uh, this is him at an earlier age in the center there. And I think uh, many of you will recognize uh, Robert Hooks uh, and uh, a fellow by the name of, of Gore, who was actually the uh, managing director for uh, the company. Um, it was Negro Ensemble uh, Company, uh, and he did take a little heat for, for heaving, using uh, him. And we're, we're going to get into that. But uh, again, uh, uh, he, he obviously uh, had a lot of uh, of, uh, of feeling for him, and uh, this is uh, this is a, a, another picture that I have uh, of him at an earlier age, probably uh, in his uh, maybe fifties or sixties. Uh, and I, I like the fact that he's got a little bit of uh, of a cocktail there, and uh, that'll bring up the opportunity for me to uh, to do a little pour tonight for for myself. I didn't have an opportunity to. Uh, to have anything prepared earlier, primarily because I've been working like crazy to make this uh, this uh, this talk. So, without any further ado, 
you'll notice I have a Norlin glass. And those of you who know what this is, it's a double insulated glass so that the heat from my fingers and my thumb will not uh, have any effect on the on the liquor that's inside. This is uh, this is a 12 year old double cask uh, single malt whiskey called Abalore, which I'm very partial to. Very nice, very nice Abalore. 12 years old, not cheap, but uh, very drinkable. And so I'm going to have a little bit, as you can see, not much. Uh, and hopefully uh, that'll get the party rolling today. So let's um, uh, let's get into it. Um, I'm going to uh, read for you uh, the uh, original uh, uh, obituary that was on the uh, New York Times, and uh, it'll give you an idea about um, uh, about uh, from whence he came uh, and uh, essentially uh, uh, where he uh, he went from from New Orleans. So if I may, uh, let me let me uh, get that uh, lined up so I can read that to you. Uh, many people like me would love to read all the New York Times uh, stories that there are out there. Unfortunately, as as uh, the cost of of uh, journalism has gone up. The New York Times no longer really allows people to see their work uh, for free. And as a result, uh, you know, I'm in a position where I'm not really able to afford the, uh, the kind of subscriptions that they, um, they have. So uh, I rely on some people sometimes to get me some of these, um, these, these uh, obituaries, et cetera, so I can share them with other people. Um, so let's see if I, can, if I can find the piece I'm looking for. Um, and I think, just give me a second here. Oh, uh, goodness. Let's see if I can find it this way. I had it all lined up, but, uh, as you know, things, things go awry sometimes. Let's see. Here we go. Okay. So Douglas Turner Ward, this is written by Nathaniel G. Nesmith, uh, an actor, playwright, and director who co-founded the celebrated Negro Ensemble Company a New York theater group that supported black writers and actors at a time when there were few opportunities for them, died Saturday, that was last Saturday, um, at his home in Manhattan. He was 90. The death was confirmed by his wife, Diana Ward. Ward was establishing his own career as an actor in 1966 when he wrote an opinion article in the New York Times with the headline, American Theater for Whites Only. I will be reading that in its entirety in just a little bit, but I would like to invite you to uh, to listen to the remainder of the uh, of the obituary. Um, if any hope outside of chance, individual fortune exists for Negro playwrights as a group, he wrote, or for that matter, Negro actors and other theater craftsmen, the most immediate, pressing, practical, absolutely minimally essential active first step is the development of a permanent Negro repertory company of at least off-Broadway size and dimension, he wrote. Not in the future, but now. That article got the attention of W. McNeil Lowry, Ford Foundation's Vice President of Humanities and the Arts, who arranged a $434,000 grant to create precisely the kind of company that Ward was proposing. Thus, the Negro Ensemble Company was born in 1967, just a year later, with Ward as artistic director, Robert Hooks as executive director, and Gerald S. Crone as administrative director. The company went on to produce critically acclaimed productions, among them Joseph A. Walker's The River Niger, 1972, which won the Tony Award for Best Play in 1974, and was adapted for film in 1976. Ward not only directed the play, but also acted in it, earning a Tony nomination for Best Featured um, Actor in a Play. Other notable productions by the company included Sam Art Williams' Home and Charles Fuller's Pulitzer Prize-winning drama A Soldier's Play in 1981 about a black officer investigating the murder of a black sergeant at a Louisiana Army base during World War II when the armed forces were segregated. The cast included Denzel Washington and Samuel L. Jackson, and it too was adapted for film as A Soldier's Story in 1984. Frank Rich of The Times called the production directed by Ward Superlative. In January 2020, the play was revived on Broadway, starring Blair Underwood, before being forced to close because of the pandemic. The Negro Ensemble Company became and continues to be a training ground for black actors, playwrights, directors, designers, and technicians, 
Many of the troops' actors over the years went on to become stars. Among them, in addition to Washington and Jackson, Angela Bassett, Louis Gossett Jr., and Felicia Rashad. The company and Ford's contribution won immediate praise after its founding. The Reverend Martin Luther King Jr. said the grant represented a magnificent step toward the creation of new and greater artists in the community. And Roy Wilkins, ex executive director of the NAACP at the time, said the foundation had, quote, recognized the potential in the Negro theater, end quote, and the talent of, quote, hundreds of actors and entertainers who have struggled individually, end quote. The company began racking up Obie, Tony, and Drama Desk Awards and recording first. In 1975, the Times critic John J. O'Connor acknowledged the historical significance of a superb television production of Lon Elder III's play, Ceremonies in Dark Old Men, set in 1950s Harlem. Quote, the event marks the debut of a major black theater organization, the Negro Ensemble Company, an American television uh, network television, he wrote. The Negro Ensemble Company enabled Ward to solidify his own career as an actor and director. I love acting for the communal thing, you know, working with people, he said in an interview with the Times in 1975. But directing, he added, quote, sort of happened to me, end quote. I never had any intention to function as a director, he continued. But as the artistic director of the company, I chose the plays. And if I can't find someone to direct them for us, I'd do it myself. One of the first plays he directed was Richard Wright and Louis Sapin's Daddy Goodness from 1968 about a town drunk in the rural South who falls into such a stupor that his friends think he is dead. In an interview, Fuller said, Doug is the only director I've worked with that could read any play and know whether its storyline and characters would work on stage. The company was not immune to criticism. The founders were criticized early on for setting up their headquarters at the St. Mark's Playhouse in Manhattan's East Village rather than at a theater in Harlem and for appointing a white administrator, Crone, who died last year at 86. Roosevelt Ward Jr. was born May 5th, 1930 in Burnside, Louisiana to Roosevelt and Dorothy Short Ward, impoverished farmers who owned their own tailoring business. His family moved to New Orleans when he was eight and he attended Xavier University Preparatory School, a historically black Roman Catholic institution. Ward was admitted to Wilberforce University in Ohio in 1946 and then transferred to the University of Michigan at Ann Arbor, where he studied politics and theater. He quit college in 19 and moved to New York City, where he met and befriended playwrights Lorraine Hansberry and Elder. In the late 1940s, Ward joined the Progressive Party and took to left-wing politics. He was arrested and convicted on charges of draft evasion and spent time in prison in New Orleans while his case was under appeal. After his conviction was overturned, he moved back to New York and became a journalist for the Communist Party newspaper, The Daily Worker. He also began studying theater, joining the Paul Mann Actors Workshop and choosing the stage name Douglas Turner Ward in homage to two men he admired, abolitionists Frederick Douglass and Nat Turner, who led a revolt against slavery. One of Ward's first acting roles was in Eugene O'Neill's The Iceman Cometh in 1956 at Circle in the Square in Manhattan. Another was an understudy in Absence, I'm sorry, an understudy in Hansberry's A Raisin in the Sun on Broadway in 1959. That starred, of course, Sidney Poitier and Claudia McNeil in the lead roles. He also began developing as a playwright in 1965, an off-Broadway double bill production of a satirical one-act comedy's Happy Ending and Day of Absence became a hit, bringing him a Drama Desk Award for Outstanding New Playwright. Surviving a transit strike, the production ran for 15 months. Ward had lead roles in many plays, including Ceremonies in Dark Old Men, for which he won the Drama Desk Award, and the Brownsville Raid, about an incident of military racial injustice in a Texas town. Clive Barnes, reviewing Brownsville for the Times, wrote the following. Ward, who, to be frank, I usually admire more as a director than an actor, has never been better, end quote. Among his many awards and honors, Ward received the Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Humanitarian Award, in 1996, he was inducted into the Theater Hall of Fame. In March, he published The Haitian Chronicles, a series of three plays that he had been working on since the 1970s, all centered on the Haitian Revolution, which threw off colonial role, rule, that is, in the 1980s, of, uh, sorry, in the 1800s. His wife said he had considered the project his magnum opus and that she and others were hoping to have the play staged in New York with alumni from the Negro Ensemble Company. In addition to Diana Ward, whom he married in 1966, he is survived by their two children, Elizabeth Ward Cupperell and Douglas Powell Ward, and three grandchildren, 
At the Negro Ensemble Company, Ward often played matchmaker in connecting actors to roles, seeking out opportunities for people whom he knew had not been getting much work. Doug never saw Annie C. as a play to feature himself. Playwright Steve Carter, who was a production coordinator for the company, said in a phone interview for this obituary in 2017, he was always looking for new people. Carter, who died last year, said Ward had been known for his willingness to step into any role in which he was needed. He recalled the particular 1972 production of a ballet behind the bridge by Trinidadian playwright Lennox Brown. With actor Gilbert Lewis unable to appear one evening, Ward was hastily summoned to fill in. Doug went on with scripted hand, Carter said. Then Ward actually injured his hand on the set and began bleeding profusely, but he refused to go to the hospital until he finished the show. He would always do what was necessary for NEC, Carter said. So that, in a nutshell, gives you uh, uh, more than just a snapshot, you know, really a, a, a full picture of, uh, of uh, Douglas Turner Ward. And uh, again, uh, he had a lot going on, you know, uh, uh, you know, there were political things he was involved with, uh, as well as artistic endeavors. And uh, he said himself, uh, in doing some of his reading uh, that I did to prepare for this uh, uh, show today, I, I had uh, heard him refer to being radicalized by none other than uh, Paul Robeson, the great actor and uh, humanitarian, uh, who was also, of course, involved with... Uh, uh, what we call today left-wing politics, um, had been a, a member of the Communist Party at, at one point and a uh, very proud uh, member as, as well. But he said that he was radicalized by Paul Robeson and that, that he took to him um, very much as a result of, of uh, his uh, influence that he became uh, interested in, in uh, helping his fellow man and, and also, of course, uh, uh, getting involved in the arts in, in the way that he did. So um, let's see if we can uh, move on. I've got a couple, of, as I say, some things that I wanted to go on. Um, first off, uh, uh, the American theater had done a, uh, a background on, on Douglas. Uh, they uh, basically have a number of, of, of uh, quotes that he had as oral histories. And I'm going to read these uh, so that you uh, can get a little bit more uh, in his, uh, his own style of, of speaking. And so, uh, these are all written pretty much, uh, without any, uh, any cleaning up of anything. It's, it's, it's pretty much the way that he spoke. And, um, these are all actual quotes from him. I was born on a plantation in Burnside, Louisiana, which is about 55 miles, uh, on the river road area between Baton Rouge and New Orleans. And my first six years were spent there until my parents moved to New Orleans. I was uh, precocious. You know, when I was taught the ABCs by my parents at a, a few years old, I fell in, in love with uh, words and ultimately language. My parents used to joke that I couldn't walk out of the house without a paperback in my back pocket. And I would forget what I was supposed to buy at the grocery store because I was so involved in terms of what I was reading. Here's another quote. I knew in high school that I was not equipped to do anything other than something involved with athletics and my love of reading. So I wanted to go to the University of Michigan to become an All-American football player. And right away, I, I played on the freshman team and found out that I wasn't any good. At Michigan, I wound up going to the library more than I went to class. There I discovered politics and I became radicalized. Here he is again. When I left Detroit, the Wallace campaign was already full force. In fact, I think that was the first time I heard Paul Robeson speak in person. I was at a big rally in Detroit. All of us wound up, and me and Lorraine, because Lorraine and I came at the same time. Of course, he's talking about Lorraine Hansberry. Immediately, we both got involved with youthful rallies. We were dueling, dueling on street corners, uh, all the different factions, you know, the, the nationalists, Muslims, and, and, and the radicals, and, and the left-wingers, and so forth. And, and the ferment of that period was wonderful, and it was a, a great training. He also wrote, I, I tend to spice up the meetings by beginning to write scripts. And that ultimately led me to decide that uh, writing for a, a live public was my, was going to be my, 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 my future interest. And by the time I was also interested in developing my playwriting, so I was studying acting at the same time. I'd been in A Raisin in the Sun. 
He also wrote, at no time had there been an audience that was more than 10% black. I needed an audience of other blacks. Robert Hooks, who was again uh, uh, his uh, co-founder, uh, spoke about his life as an actor early on. He said he was a young, thriving actor, wannabe actor in Philadelphia when A Raisin in the Sun came through, and uh, I'd never seen a play with so many black actors. Uh, blew me away. Uh, sitting at the Walnut Street Theater. I had to go backstage, went backstage, met a lot of the actors. This one, pointing to Douglas Turner Ward sitting next to him, and uh, another one of my friends who, he's not here with us anymore, Lonnie Elder III. The two of them were very supportive. I came to New York, and as fate would have it, the first professional play that I got was in The Rays in the Sun, which allowed me to be together with my, my dear friends. That's how we met. Douglas Turner Ward continued, my play, Day of Absence, was inspired by my visit to Montgomery during the day of the bus boycott and the absurdity they had observed of the buses still running. Blacks were not riding the buses, but they were still running through the regular stops as if somebody was going to get on. That image that said to me eventually translated into a satirical play called Day of Absence, where all the blacks vanished. Theatrically, Brechtian style, the play is done in whiteface. The play was too short at that time, so I had to have a companion piece, and I used a real-life experience to write a shorter piece called Happy Ending, which was also satirical, but it's styled a little more accessible. I decided that I wasn't interested in in addressing my plays to a general public. I was interested in addressing my plays to a black audience. That impact remained successful and throughout our whole history. It turned out that our primary audience was 80% black. He also said, I came up with an article that was titled American Theater for Whites Only. And in that article, I uh, analyzed the position of blacks at the time. That article came to the attention of McNeil Lowry at the Ford Foundation. I went then back to my colleagues, Robert Hooks and Gerald Crohn's and eventually came up with a proposal and the rest is history. So that article that he referred to, uh, I'd like to, uh, to share that as well. Um, just an amazing piece of writing. And uh, again, I have to say that, that uh, for those of you who did not know about, about uh, Douglas Turner Ward, uh, it's a wonderful uh, opportunity to, uh, to share and, uh, you know, to, to basically uh, let people who don't know about that history know a little bit more about it. Um, let's see if I can uh, get to that, uh, that piece that I'm looking for right now. And if you'll bear with me a second, I have it saved here, but I have to look for it. Let's see. I have, unfortunately, a lot more things going on sometimes than I should. Ah, oh, okay. So I would asked a friend of mine to send it to me, and for some reason he's trying to get me to share it out. <laughs> and that ain't what I wanted to do. Um, so, in any event, let's see if it's here. Yeah, let's see. Okay, well, I guess we'll have to share it to Facebook in order to be able to see it. Why not? I can always unshare it later on. Okay, let's go back. And see if I can find it now. Sorry about that. All I asked for was the article. Now here comes the article. Here we go. Okay, so this was written again, uh, I believe it was August the 14th, 1966. And uh, it was written by Douglas Turner Ward. And uh, I'm going to read it as it appears on... Uh, on American Theater Magazine. And again, it's titled uh, American Theater for Whites Only. During the last decade, coinciding with the explosion of Negro civil rights movements into public consciousness, a number of Negro playwrights have gained considerable notice. Lewis Peterson, Lorraine Hansberry, Ossie Davis, James Baldwin, Leroy Jones, and others. Collectors of awards and honors 
a few catapulted into international fame and dramatic prominence, critical barometers and Geiger counters whipped out to gauge possible wins, trends, and resulting fallout. However, this flurry of attention has tended to misrepresent the real status of Negro playwrights. Despite an eminent handful, Negro dramatists remain sparse in number, production sporadic at most, and scripts too few to indicate discernible trends. Moreover, even when deemed successful, the critical and financial rewards reaped by A Raisin in the Sun accepted, and on a smaller scale, Leroy Jones' Dutchman, few productions have managed to recoup capitalization. No, the millennium has not been reached. Many factors contribute to this situation, but surveying the total landscape of American theater, results could hardly be otherwise. The legitimate theater, that fabulous invalid, which compared to its electronic bed partner, is still dreamed of as the repository of high culture and artistic achievement in America, hardly qualifies when examined from a Negro viewpoint. Tirelessly, predictably, almost repetitiously on cue, theater critics and other Jeremiahs deplore rampant commercialism, the monopoly of escapist musicals, the dominance of brittle, frothy comedies, and the inadequacy of experimental ventures. They also leave the impression that a little minor surgery would work wonders, that palliatives could restore health, but the patient is sicker than even the most pessimistic diagnosis suggests. No matter how severe the prognosis, pundits seldom question the basic structures or assumptions of their theater. With rare exceptions, an occasional native play of quality or intermittent foreign infusions, American legit theater, even at its most ambitious seriousness, is essentially a theater of the bourgeois, by the bourgeois, about the bourgeois, and for the bourgeois. A pretentious theater elevating the narrow preoccupations of restricted class interests to inflated universal significance, tacitly assuming that its middle class, affluent oriented absorptions are central to the dominant human condition. A theater rarely embracing broader frames of reference or more inclusive concerns. A theater, even if it tried, incapable of engaging the attention of anyone not so fortunate as to possess a college diploma or five-figure salary. More specifically, a theater in its lofty modern niche, Broadway, off-Broadway, off-off-Broadway. Happenings land, wherever, overwhelmingly riddled with works of in-group concerns, bell lectures, pomposity, instant despair, stultifying boredom, humorless humor, hasty pudding hijinks, and pseudo-absurdity. A theater of diversion. A diversionary theater whose main problem is not that it's too safe, but that it is surpassingly irrelevant. Occasionally, productions of stature and significance must usually display a cachet of foreign authorship and reputation to justify presentation. Maybe this is all it should be. Computer consensus, as yet, doesn't spawn meaningful plays. The most powerful country in the Western world doesn't necessarily usher in a golden age of drama. It is not surprising that the Negro playwright and the power of his potential fit only peripherally into his spectrum. By his mere historical placement in American society, the Negro exists as a disturbing presence, an embarrassment to majority comfort, an actuality deflating pretenses, an implicit witness and cogent critic too immediate for attention. Also, just as in real life, a black playwright, sight unseen, play unheard, it's soothsayed as too bothersome, a pride to the sleeping conscience of numerical superiors. The stage establishment, like Hollywood, consigns even the most innocuous Negro subject matter to an ogre category of problem drama. Even sympathetic advisors constantly bug the draft craftsmen to shun racial themes and aspire to that pantheon of Olympian universality, which all white playwrights, ironically enough, can enter by merely getting themselves born. As one naive, well-meaning, but frightfully boorish scribe put it, quote, no longer Negro playwright, just playwright, end quote. Whoever heard of batting an eyelash of lower caste condensation when Sean O'Casey is mentioned as an Irish playwright? That the Negro playwright is more or less excluded from legit boulevards is not a revelation for concern. More important is the fact that even when produced within this environment, the very essence of his creative function is jeopardized. His plays stand to be witnessed and assessed by a majority least equipped to understand his intentions, woefully apathetic or anesthetized to his experience, 
often prone to distort his purpose. Spectators who, though afflicted with self-imposed ignorance, demand to be taught ABCs at the very moment when the writer is impatient to explore the algebra of his thematic equations. Observers, even when most sympathetic, whose attitudes have been repeatedly shaped by preconceptions and misconceptions, warped by superficial cliches and platitudes, liberal, conservative, or radical though they may be. Catering to such insistence presages barren results. With imagination short-circuited, valuable time is wasted cluing in. Exposition is demanded when action should be unfolding. The obvious must be over-illustrated and fantasy literalized. Finally, when the curtain descends, whether the writer has pampered illusions, lectured ignorance, comforted fears, shouted for attention, or flagellated consciousness. Probability dictates his defeat and the victory of customers, triumphantly intact in their limitations. With tears dry, the shouting quieted, or the arches of the cat and nine tail subsided, the writer has been neatly appropriated, usurped, his creativity subverted. For those Negro playwrights eager to volunteer for this function, there's no advice to offer. They know the rules, they play the game, and take their chances. But for a Negro playwright committed to examining the contours, context, and depths of his experience from an unfettered, imaginative Negro angle of vision, the screaming need is for a sufficient audience of other Negroes, better informed through commonly shared experience, to readily understand, debate, confirm, or reject the truth or falsity of his creative explorations. Not necessarily an all-black audience to the exclusion of whites, but for the playwright, certainly his primary audience, the first persons of his address, potentially the most advanced, the most responsive, or most critical. Only through their initial and continuous participation can his intent and purpose be best perceived by others. The validity of this premise has been borne out previously in other productions, and most recently among, during the current run of my own plays, Happy Ending and Day of Absence, two works of satirical content written from an unapologetic Negro viewpoint. Throughout the run, Negro attendance has averaged close to 50%, hundreds witnessing a professional play for the first time. Besides contributing immeasurably to the longevity of the run, the freshness of the response, immediacy of involvement, and spontaneity of participation have significantly underscored the essence of the works themselves and provided crucial illuminations for others. With Negroes responding all around, white spectators, congenitally uneasy in the presence of Negro satire, at least can't fail to get the message. Any future hope for the Negro playwright depends upon whether or not this minuscule, singular, all too infrequent experience can be extended, multiplied, and made permanent. As long as the Negro playwright remains totally dependent on existing outlets, he stands to continue as a pauper begging sustenance, never knowing from day to day, year to year, whether a few scraps will be tossed his way. Even burgeoning tax-supported, privately endowed repertory companies are beyond the reach of his ambition. Imagine rushing to present Day of Absence or any other work which would require jobbing in 15 Negro actors when your roster only allows for two or three at most, often tokens at that. Eventually, an all-embracing, all-encompassing theater of Negro identity, organized as an adjunct of some Negro community, might ideally solve the Negro dramatist's dilemma. But such a development, to me, must arise as part of a massive effort to reconstruct the urban ghetto. Small-scale cultural islands in the midst of the ghettos, separate and apart from a committed program of social and economic revitalization of slums, are doomed to exotic isolation. Meanwhile, potential talent ready for exercise cannot wait. Without engagement, it lies dormant, stillborn. Time passes. Aging proceeds. The talent withers and eventually dies of non-use. If any hope outside of chance individual fortune exists for Negro playwrights as a group, or for that matter, Negro actors and other theater craftsmen, the most immediate, pressing, practical, absolutely minimally essential active first step is the development of a permanent Negro repertory company of at least off-Broadway size and dimension, not in the future, but now. A theater evolving not out of negative need, but positive potential, better equipped to employ existing talents and spur the development of future ones. A theater whose justification is not the gap it fills, but the achievement it aspires toward, no less high than any other comparable theater company of present or past world fame. A theater concentrating primarily on themes of Negro life, but also resilient enough to incorporate and interpret the best of world drama, whatever the source. 
a theater of permanence, continuity, and consistency, providing the necessary home base for the Negro artist to launch a campaign to win his ignored brothers and sisters as constant witnesses to his endeavors. This is not a plea for either. This is not a plea for either a segregated theater or a separatist one. Negroes constitute a numerical minority, but Negro experience from slavery to civil rights has always been of crucial importance to America's existence. There's no reason why whites could not participate in a theater dedicated to exploring and illuminating that experience if they found inspiration in the purpose. Also, just as the intrusion of lower middle class and working class voices reinvigorated polite, effete English drama, so might the Negro, a most potential agent of vitality, infuse life into the moribund corpus of American theater. That is an amazing piece. And again, I'm so delighted to be able to share it with you. Again, those of you who are, are out there listening in, I, I appreciate. I uh, hope that, uh, that uh, those of you who have missed this broadcast will at least uh, take time out to uh, uh, listen to the words of Douglas Turner Ward, uh, a man of, of, of great uh, resource uh, uh, who realized his potential in New York, established the Negro Ensemble Company, uh, and, and made it possible for Negro theater, as it were, as it, he called it there, black theater in America, uh, to go forth from New York and to spread into all the other outlying communities. And so, uh, uh, again, I thought it was an important thing to, to note his passing, his connection to New Orleans, uh, notwithstanding as a youngster, and also his connection as a, uh, uh, as a resident of our uh, prison uh, here, uh, during the time that he was being tried, and uh, I'm I'm glad to say that that uh, uh, he was not uh, in prison for apparently a long time, but that uh, uh, he was able to extricate himself from that uh, indelicate position. Uh, so again, uh, not seeing any comments or not seeing any uh, uh, indications that uh, anybody wants to contribute tonight. Uh, again, I'll probably sign off a little early tonight. If anybody is interested, though, uh, please feel free to. Uh, uh, to join the conversation, StreamYard.com, and there's the the rest of it right there. You can just uh, copy and paste that into your uh, your browser and uh, become part of our broadcast. Um, I have uh, uh, many of you noted, uh, or maybe not have noted. Uh, I, I've sort of shut down a number of the broadcasts that we've been doing. I've been trying to do as many as I can on Mondays and Fridays. Uh, quite honestly. Uh, uh, a lot of the uh, the shows that I was intent on bringing, a lot of them are are um, slow in coming. So a lot of the Monday nights that I would have liked to have filled up with uh, original plays or plays that uh, were one acts that we would present maybe on a, a one act uh, uh, grouping of of plays, et cetera. There would be more than one in one particular night, uh, or perhaps uh, to do some some other works uh, that hadn't been done yet, uh, just have not uh, happened and. Uh, Again, uh, we're dealing with a, a, a new enforcement of the uh, of the uh, contracts that exist for the uh, various uh, actors' unions, uh, uh, and uh, so we have to be compliant if there are any people who are involved who are members of either Actors Equity, Equity or the uh, SAG-AFTRA uh, union, uh, Screen Actors Guild, and uh, and the American Federation of Television and Radio Artists. So um, those two groups have dictated as to what can be uh, uh, basically dealt with, uh, in most cases, uh, uh, these kinds of live stream readings are, are allowed, but, uh, in the case of, uh, of, uh, productions that require, uh, filming out of sequence or perhaps, uh, uh, involve, uh, set designs and things of that sort, not just, uh, the, uh, readings that you might see, uh, they require, uh, uh some, deliberations as to whether or not that that uh, is in in the uh, spirit of of what the uh, unions are intending so we haven't done a whole lot of those but we're looking still to do it if anybody out there has uh, some plays uh, that have been written by them or by friends that uh, they'd like to see produced i'm very interested in making that happen uh, again we've had some wonderful productions this past year it's uh it's a shame that uh we couldn't keep all of them up but uh, because of uh of publication rights, uh, many of the uh, uh, productions that we did, such as uh, the trilogy of John Bigonet's uh, plays, uh, 
are, are no longer available. They, they were taken down shortly thereafter. And what a shame because, of course, uh, one of the people associated with those productions, Gregory Johnson, passed away from, from COVID uh, uh, at the end of last year. And uh, uh, just a tragic situation that uh, we weren't able to keep him here. And, and of course, uh, he contributed in many, many ways to some of the uh, after uh, production uh, talkbacks that we had with our, uh, our cast. And uh, just such a delight, uh, a wonderful man. Uh, we will miss him. Of course, uh, my good friend, I wish, wish I would have had her on tonight to talk because I bet if anybody had a con conversation or got together with Douglas Turner Ward, uh, the late, great Carol Sutton would have been one of those people. And uh, uh, so I, I bemoan the fact that she's passed on as well, again, due to COVID. Uh, one of the other members of our, our community, uh, Sherry Marina, died around the same time. Um, and she was very involved with the uh, Actors' Equity Group, was the vice president. Uh, so again, you know, we've all experienced loss and, and we'll continue to do that, uh, I guess, as, as we move forward in this pandemic. But uh, there is light at the end of the tunnel. And uh, as we saw last year, uh, a, a lot of the questions that were asked about where black theater belongs and, and uh, where uh, e equity and uh, inclusivity and diversity belongs, you know, are being asked with uh, greater urgency than ever before. Uh, I think that uh, as all of those questions are asked and as changes are made, uh, that we should keep tight to and remember the legacy of Douglas Turner Ward and, and all that he did uh, in helping establish uh, a, a more meaningful presence for uh, black theater. And again, uh, I wanna thank everybody who was here tonight to be with me. Again, my name is uh, is Alan Smason, and uh, this has been NOLA Theater Talk. We're going to close it out a little early. I'm going to have my drink now, so uh, hopefully uh, have a good time. And uh, again, for those of you who uh, are looking to see this or promote it, uh, it's on the NOLA Theater Folk Facebook group. We also show it on the theatercriticism.com Facebook page. And additionally, we'll, uh, we'll show for those people who are on, on Facebook on YouTube, the uh, YouTube channel, and, and you can get to it either by looking at my name or using the, uh, the name of the channel. So that's going to do it for, for me tonight. Thank you all for joining me. I hope that, uh, that uh, uh, you, uh, if you weren't familiar with Douglas Turner Ward, that uh, you are now and that uh, you uh, permitted me the opportunity uh, to uh, familiarize him with you through his readings and his, uh, his memories. And uh, again, I thank you all for being with me tonight. Uh, don't have any new shows to announce just yet. Hopefully uh, we'll have... Uh, have some great shows coming up. I'm looking to do some more uh, as we move forward. So uh, stick around for all of that. Again, for uh, NOLA Theater Talk, Alan Smason saying, I'll see you at the theater.